Even though the Malfoys aren't the big bads in Harry Potter, the family manages to find themselves at the heart of a lot of what happens during the series. And a lot of the time, the things that the family did to end up there don't really add up. Even when you look past Harry's bias, the family has a lot of history that raises some eyebrows. From the way that the Wizarding World views them, their control over Hogwarts, and even their personal relationships, there's a lot about the Malfoy family that just doesn't make sense. When you look at Narcissa Malfoy, she seems like the exact type of person who would be a Death Eater. Not only is she a Malfoy, but Narcissa is also a Black. Everybody she knew had the dark mark on their arms. Even during the Second Wizarding War, the Malfoy family mansion was even a meeting spot for many of the Death Eaters' meetings. In the end, though, Narcissa herself never took the plunge. She certainly believed in Voldemort's blood purity ideals. And while there aren't a lot of women seen among the main Death Eaters, Bellatrix proves that women can receive the Dark Mark. So then why did Narcissa never officially join their ranks? Voldemort clearly has some trust in her. Narcissa is seen in quite a few of the Death Eaters' meetings, and she's allowed to know a lot of the Death Eaters' biggest plans. In The Half-Blood Prince, Narcissa is one of the few people told about the plans to kill Dumbledore. When she goes up to Snape to ask him to help Draco, she says, I know I ought not be here. The Dark Lord himself forbade me to speak of this. Suggesting that Voldemort himself allowed Narcissa to hear the plan. <laughs> So, with the Dark Lord's trust, family ties, and her belief in blood purity, Narcissa would be an obvious Death Eater. Yet, J.K. Rowling herself confirmed that she never obtained the Dark Mark or joined their ranks. With all the acts done in the name of the Dark Lord, the Malfoy families have almost always managed to avoid punishment. Even though everybody knew that Lucius Malfoy was a Death Eater, his claim to have been under the Imperious Curse was enough for him to avoid Azkaban. And the same thing happens at the end of the Second Wizarding War. The last-minute change in sides placed the Malfoys in the Great Hall after Voldemort's defeat, even if three were unsure if they should be there. But it wasn't just Lucius, Draco, and Narcissa that had a knack for avoiding trouble. One of their ancestors, Nicholas Malfoy, had been a landlord during the 1300s, when the Black Plague ran rampant around Britain. Nicholas took this as a chance to kill his muggle tenants. Even though everybody knew he'd done it, Nicholas never even had to face a trial. Abraxas Malfoy, Lucius's father, also managed to avoid punishment for his part in causing the first muggle-born minister of magic to step down. His involvement became nothing more than a rumor. The only time that a Malfoy is ever punished is after the Battle of the Department of Mysteries. Lucius is thrown into Azkaban after he is caught working alongside Voldemort, but even then, the punishment is cut short. A year after his imprisonment, Lucius and the rest of the Death Eaters were freed by Voldemort himself. So, even when they get caught, the Malfoys have a strange knack for avoiding punishment. Despite everything, the Malfoys are still a respected family. Draco is flocked to by other students at Hogwarts simply because of his name. Plus, in their first year, Draco thinks that he can befriend Harry simply by telling him his last name. Draco Malfoy. And it's not just Draco who gets respected because of his name. During the Quidditch World Cup, Lucius and Draco are invited to join the Minister of Magic in his booth. Even with the whole family being known to have ties to Voldemort, the Wizarding World is still shown to respect the Malfoys. In the Order of the Phoenix, Lucius is seen hanging around the Ministry, despite not actually working there. The community listens to the family, even when they have no reason to. And that respect manages to spread past just the Ministry. While neither the Malfoys nor the Ministry technically has control over Hogwarts, they still have control over the school. In the Chamber of Secrets, Lucius is able to come to the school and remove Dumbledore from his position as headmaster. Then, in The Prisoner of Azkaban, it's thanks to Draco and Lucius that Buckbeak is sentenced to execution. Buckbeak's been sentenced to death! During Buckbeak's beheading, Lucius is the one who stood opposite Hagrid and demanded that the Hippogriff be put down. In the end, even though it was Draco who refused to listen to the instructions, the family was able to win the case. And let's be real, if the attack had happened to anyone else, nothing would have come of it. There were plenty more serious injuries that happened to the students of Hogwarts without the Ministry getting involved. All of it was because it was the Malfoys. And speaking about power at Hogwarts that makes no sense, how did Draco become a prefect? Throughout his time at the school, Draco was a known bully. If you were a muggle-born, or just not in Slytherin, Draco wouldn't hesitate to bully you. He's also notorious for his use of the word mudblood, using the term on Hermione in their second year. You filthy little mudblood. 
At no point does Draco show signs of being someone who could lead by example or help first years. Despite all this, Draco is still given a prefect badge in his fifth year. In the books, he mocks Harry for not getting the same honor and abuses the power to take points from others or give detentions. He abused his powers so much that him not doing so is one of the reasons Harry knew something was off with him in the Half-Blood Prince. So why was Draco chosen to be the Slytherin prefect? Sure, Snape who had a fondness for Draco, would choose Draco. But why would the other professors approve? And why didn't Dumbledore step in to stop it? Dumbledore has some control over who's a prefect. He admits to Harry that he didn't want him to get the title because he was worried Harry already had too much on his mind. With other professors and the headmaster getting a clear say in who gets to be a prefect, it doesn't make sense that Draco would be entrusted with the responsibility. Another person who got a responsibility they definitely shouldn't have is Lucius. At some point before the story begins, Voldemort gives Lucius his diary. While all the other Horcruxes were placed in meaningful locations, this one wasn't. The only other Horcrux ever entrusted to another person was the Hufflepuff Cup. But while Voldemort gave Bellatrix the cup so he'd have a part of himself in Gringotts, an honor that his lack of parents left him without, the diary was seemingly given without a reason. Lucius doesn't hide it away or honor it, he just has it. And the Malfoys having the diary makes even less sense when you remember that it was the first Horcrux. With how symbolic and meaningful every other choice surrounding the Horcruxes were, it doesn't make sense that Voldemort would be so careless about the first one. The diary marks his first murder. It contains the biggest part of himself and can communicate with people who write inside of it. Even with Lucius Malfoy being the Dark Lord's right-hand man, it doesn't make sense that he would be given the diary. Not when it was both so meaningful and so powerful. But Lucius being given the diary isn't even the most confusing thing. That honor goes to Lucius giving Ginny the book in the first place. From the second chapter of the Chamber of Secrets, when Dobby appears, he tells Harry about a plot that was going to happen at Hogwarts. This plot was opening the Chamber of Secrets. So, how did Lucius know that the diary would be able to possess someone? How did he know when the Weasleys would go to Diagon Alley to give it to one of their kids? How did he know that the book would even be used? Or that they wouldn't hand it over to Dumbledore the minute it started talking back? Even if Voldemort had told them to get the book to Hogwarts so he could open the Chamber of Secrets during the First Wizarding War, why would Lucius decide to do it now? after 12 years of the Dark Lord being dead. Why would Lucius risk doing anything related to his old master? And if he didn't, if Lucius just wanted to make the Weasleys look bad, how did he know enough about the diary and the Chamber of Secrets to set all of this up? The entire plot of the Chamber of Secrets relies on Lucius wanting to open the Chamber of Secrets and discredit the Weasley family name, but it raises a lot of questions and doesn't make a lot of sense. After the Second Wizarding War, the Malfoy family continues to make odd decisions. When Astoria and Draco have Scorpius, the blood curse that Astoria had became worse, making her frail and weak. But there was no known cure for a blood curse. There has to be something that could raise Astoria's constitution. They could have looked for a magical or a muggle solution, but instead of going to a healer at St. Mungo's, or even trying chewable vitamins, the family went into isolation. In The Cursed Child, it's revealed that this decision to lock themselves away caused a lot of problems. Not only did Scorpius grow up lonely, with only the books in their family library to pass the time, but it also led to rumors. By the time he first got to step onto the Hogwarts Express where he'd meet Albus, people already believed that Scorpius was actually the son of Voldemort. And finally, we have Scorpius's love life. In The Cursed Child, it's made clear that Scorpius is in love with Rose, Ron and Hermione's daughter. What isn't clear is why. From their very first meeting, Rose is dismissive of Scorpius. She believes the rumors about him being the son of Voldemort and hates him simply because of his parents. Rose goes on to ignore him, hate Albus just for being his best friend, and just treat the pair terribly. But for his first four years at Hogwarts, Scorpius is crazy about her, despite getting rejected multiple times. He still asks Rose out, even at the end of the play. When Scorpius sees that Rose pities him after yet another rejection, he feels hopeful that it means she's warming up to him. Scorpius's big, happy ending is the chance that maybe the girl who hates him will date him. And that just doesn't make sense. At the end of the day, there's a lot about the Malfoy family that doesn't make a lot of sense. Maybe it's because we don't see the story from their point of view, so we can't understand them. Then again, the family is rich. That alone is probably enough to explain half of this list.